and welcome to a soft, blurry, but yet still somehow retina-searing edition of the Oddity Archive. Well, it's request day here in Archive Land, which translates to I've gotten so many requests for this topic that I just can't ignore it any longer. So today, let's finally tackle that staple of 70s and 80s television. If you don't know the name, you've probably at least seen it in action at some point in your life. I'm talking about Scanimate. Scanimate. Let it work. Now, I've been reluctant to cover this topic for two reasons. One... I'm just not enough of a computer geek to really grasp the technology, and two, resources on this topic are pretty few and far between. So with that in mind, I'd like to direct your attention to a pair of DVDs which have proven to be the main resources for today's episode. And those would be Scanimate DVD 1, which is a compilation of Scanimate content, and The Dream Machine, which is a documentary on the technology and people behind Scanimate. And if you're interested in picking up copies of these DVDs, as of the making of this episode, these are still available at Scanimate.net, so go over there if you're so inclined. Now, as for us here... <sighs> you've just locked yourself into a full-fledged history lesson episode. Hello, folks. I'm Mr. Computer Image for ABC. I'm generated by a computer. Scanimate was not the first attempt at, effectively, computer animation. The story starts in about 1956 with Lee Harrison III, who eventually created Scanimate. A friend, on a whim, convinced Lee to run off with him to the Andes Mountains in South America, simply to hear the mission bells toll. They only got as far as Guatemala. However, in Guatemala, Harrison had an idea to create a new, more streamlined, more efficient method of animation. Harrison, who already held a fine arts degree, opted to go back to school to acquire a mechanical engineering degree. After graduation, Harrison got a job at Philco Electronics in Philadelphia. Soon after, the company declared bankruptcy, was bought out by Ford Motors, and started the move to a new location. To cut costs, Philco intended to simply throw out their supply of electronic parts. Harrison proceeded to take a suitcase worth of parts home with him every day until the move was complete. Back home in the suburb of Bluebell, Harrison went to work on building a prototype out of his collection of stray parts. This machine became known as the Bone Generator, which was output to an oscilloscope. As the name implies, the Bone Generator was able to generate animations of, at least the lower half of, stick figures, which functioned from a central point, with further points of movement that resembled knees and feet. As best as my non-computer brain can deduce, the position and movement of each limb was programmed into the machine, which in turn would project them in a specific direction and sequence, then retract back into the so-called standing position of each line. At the same time that Lee Harrison was playing around with his bone generator, Bell Labs, yep, the old Ma Bell, went to work on explicitly computer-generated animation. The first confirmed use of computer animation was in a 1962 short film on the effects of a nuclear explosion. I've had no luck finding this film. 
The earliest example of computer animation that I can find dates to 1963. It's a one minute example of vector graphics. The earliest raster based example I can find dates to 1964. It's a rather dry, slow, silent informational short describing the Beflix, a Bell Flix process that Bell Labs was developing at the time. The remnants of this style can still be periodically seen today. The most famous of the Bell Labs films would have to be the ultra psychedelic and potentially seizure-inducing, Poem Field Films, made from about 1966 to 71. Hope you like free jazz. In 1965, Lee Harrison set up camp in Denver, Colorado. Around 1967, Harrison went professional with his animations and opened the Computer Image Corporation. By this point, the bone generator machine had evolved to the point where it could allow for more than just stick figures, but not by much. Now named Animac, short for Animation Computer, Harrison could generate abstract figures by adding in more... math stuff that I don't comprehend. In the case of the Mr. Noise figure, the eyes and mouth were created with parabolas and sine waves. The most famous slash infamous thing to come out of Animac was also a major part of one of the most infamous and short-lived shows in television history. The show was called Turn On, which was supposed to be effectively Laugh-In 2.0 and was created by the same person. The basic premise was that Turn On was allegedly a 100% computer-generated sketch comedy show. The computer was also the host. While there's no publicly available footage of the so-called host in action, there is some all-too-brief footage of Turn-On's equivalent to the laugh-in dance segues. These were created by hooking a real live dancer to a homemade motion capture harness partially built out of Tinker Toys and Lincoln Logs. This would cause a vaguely life-form-ish on-screen blob to start dancing in time with the real dancer's movements. The computer couldn't keep up with the dancer, and the dancer had to seriously simplify her movements and slow her speed. As for Turn On, it only lasted one episode, aired on ABC on February 5th, 1969. Actually, in Cleveland, Ohio, only half of it got aired before it was pulled. The remaining time was filled with some impromptu organ music and a station slide. As for Animac, that ability to interpret real-life objects pointed the way towards Lee Harrison's two most famous accomplishments. At about the same time that Scanimate was being introduced, Lee Harrison developed a system designed to streamline and speed up the making of cartoons. This system was known as Caesar, or Computer Animated Episodes Using Single Axis Rotation. Caesar's most notable ability was to allow for individual elements of traditional hand-drawn cartoons, eyes, mouth, etc., to be merged together and manipulated to emulate traditional animation. Backgrounds could be tackled the same way, but were just as often a static animation cell. Under the Caesar system, images could be broken up into eight sections, which could then be moved independently. 
Caesar had eight available keyframes, read beginning or end markers of a movement. After each eight keyframes, which may only account for a second or two of animation, the animation had to be printed to videotape before you could proceed any farther. Over time, the overlap between Caesar and Scanimate grew ever greater. In the fall of 1969, Lee Harrison issued an initial public offering for the newly designed and named Scanimate system. Six million dollars was raised. The money was used to build more gear and buy up existing commercial production firms like Dolphin Productions, based out of New York City. This was no accident, as the main selling point for the Scanimate, uh, read scanned animation, was that it could interpret real-life objects, like a company logo for a TV commercial. The most common process was as follows. A logo or some text would be printed on cotolith paper, known for its high contrast levels. This would be scanned into the Scanimate. From there, the material could be divided into as many as five individual pieces, then be reconstructed and manipulated into a fluid, futuristic-looking piece of art, and be done at a fraction of the cost and time of then-traditional hand-animated work. To put this in perspective, a traditional, fully animated TV commercial could take three months or more, with large crews and budgets well into the six figures. An average scanimation could be done and delivered in a few days with one artist, a few technicians, and a low to mid five-figure budget. Basic scanimations could be done and delivered in as little as a day. While Scanimate was ostensibly computer animation, the Scanimate system was more a video synthesizer than anything else. To put things in perspective, on an early music synthesizer, feedback generated by an oscillator is processed through individual filters and such, which could be used to create new undefined sounds or eventually emulate a particular instrument. Scanimate used those same basic ideas to create and manipulate images. It's just that the, if you will, feedback is now visual. On the simpler end of Scanimate, you've got, for example, a company logo, be it paint, photography, or an actual model, that moves and glows a bit. Lots of old TV station IDs are like this. Benny Hill will continue in just a moment. Disco Los Angeles. However, most Scanimate is a balance of the real item in the foreground against a completely synthesized background. Think every radio station ad made between 1978 and 82. And on the more complex end of Scanimation, you've got the obligatory, fully synthesized aerial shots and flying effects. But having said that, the most famous Scanimations are probably the most sophisticated ones. The Scanimate process was used in films like Star Wars, albeit only briefly, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and Flight of the Navigator, and of course early music videos from the likes of The Jacksons and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Given how difficult it was to operate, it shouldn't come as any surprise that only eight Scanimate machines were ever made, and I believe at its peak they were all in use somewhere in the world. Now, despite the success and outright ubiquity of Scanimation, 
it had some genuine setbacks. For one, during the late 70s and early 80s, new methods of, at times, fully digital computer animation were coming into play. Methods less idiosyncratic than Scanimation. In addition to the difficult operation of the machines, Scanimate was, thanks to the constant handling, in constant need of maintenance and repairs, as were the two-inch videotape recorders that the Scanimate rendered to. By around 1983, the Scanimate industry was starting to lose money, so much so that there were times when payroll couldn't be met. Despite Lee Harrison's willingness to go out of pocket and take out loans to keep Scanimate afloat, it simply could no longer compete. Scanimate went out of use in about 1986. I haven't found anything about Lee Harrison's life after Scanimate. All I know is he died in 1998. As of the fall of 2017, two of the eight remaining Scanimates still existed, the first and last ones. Both are in the hands of engineer Dave Sieg. As of this episode, the original one is presumably still set up and in occasional use in his North Carolina home, while the final one presumably remains in storage. Once again, if you'd like to dig deeper into Scanimate, please pick up Dave Sieg's two DVDs on the topic at Scanimate.net. The sales of these things is partially how he keeps that original machine up and running. But anyway, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I read off a bunch of angry YouTube comments all upset that this wasn't the definitive statement on Scanimate. God, I'm getting so sick of using that word. Scanimate, that is. Uh, just used it again. El que andaba ausente. No se azoten que hay vídeos. Calma, ya regresó de Alemania su león papuchón. No más fui a ver qué tan fieros son mis hermanitos los leoncitos alemanes. Y la verdad, tan fieros somos los guapeles de aquí como los guapeles de allá. I said, you'll never animate a character with a computer. <laughs>